It's finally here. Axe Judgment Day number one released this week from Marvel Comics. And I must say, I do I do recommend the comic book, but there are some real, real execution issues. And there's some things that make me very frustrated with what happens within this comic book. But at least something happens because we did get the the Eve of Judgment issue last week, which was all exposition. I think they could have taken a lot of the stuff that was in this story, moved it over that issue, made it more interesting, and then made this a little bit more action-packed and really showed the ramifications and actually sell them as big events happening within the comic book. Because here they kind of just wrap things up and clean everything up within a page or two of what are supposed to be enormous events happening. We've been told since Hox and Pox, House of X, Powers of Ten, that the mutant, mutants have resurrection, but it's all because of the five. And they are so important, they can't jeopardize their safety. And if one of them dies, you know, it's kind of all over. The dream is done for the X-Men. Well, here's a spoiler. That happens in this comic book. And it turns out it's not a really big deal. And it's just stuff like that that just really frustrates me with Marvel Comics, DC Comics, certainly with the X-Men. Here we have Kieran Gillen, Valerio Shidi writing this big Eternals X-Men Avengers crossover book. Lots of characters in this. And there's certainly a lot of action once you get through the exposition at the very beginning of the comic book. Now let's get right into it. Let's talk about what happens here. In the very beginning, we see Tony Stark sitting down having a lunch date with Cersei. And they're somewhat flirting back and forth and they're talking. And I know, but you don't know. And you don't know, but I don't know. And it turns out it's all a setup for the Avengers to kidnap Cersei. We see Echo arrive from the skies and kidnap Cersei, takes her into space, and they take her into the confines of Avengers Mountain, which is a dead celestial that's been cadenced since, I believe, issue number one or two of Jason Aaron's Avengers run. So there are some deep cuts within this comic book, and it certainly plays out a lot of storylines that have been building up over the past few years, especially in the X-Men itself. They sit Cersei down, and Tony Stark is essentially interrogating her. They're talking about Thanos and how he was the leader. and They penetrated Avengers Mountain and all this stuff has happened. And he's starting to learn that the Eternals themselves are fractured. They're a society. They're not a monolith. And she is from a group that is actually broken off from Druid and a lot of the rest of the Eternals. So they're having this conversation. They're getting nowhere. She's saying, Tony, you tell me what you know. And maybe I'll tell you what I know. And he's like, I would never tell you what you know. And then Captain America comes in. And they're like, she's going to be able to read you like a book. And then he tells her what she knows. And that's basically the interrogation portion of the comic book at the very beginning. And then we get to Olympia and the Eternals. And Druig is addressing the uni mind. And he's laying out that the mutants are, in fact, deviants. Not just deviants. They're excess deviation. And they need to be corrected by the Eternals. That's what they're in this damn universe for. And he kind of lays out what the mutants have done on Krakoa, and that they're immortal now, and their powers were originally derived from deviants and all this stuff. And he asked for their approval to go and attack Krakoa as well as Araco. It's not just the mutant deviants on Earth that they need to correct. They need to correct the deviants on Araco as well. And he gets the big old thumbs up. And Druid goes and finds Uranus, who's been held in some type of cell. It turns out this character is the grandfather of Thanos and is very powerful. But somehow they have him under lock and key, but they can let him out for periods of time. And Druid says, I'm going to let you out for an hour to do your worst. And then I'm going to bring you right back here to your holding cell. And we see that part happen. And then he teleports back to Earth, apparently. He's in L.A., and he's having a business meeting with Moira McTaggart. And this is kind of where I think Kieran Gillen, being embarrassed about being a superhero comic book writer, really shines through. I think he wants to be known as, like, an author, not a comic book writer. That's really beneath him. So instead of showing a lot of action, you have these two characters a lot of the time explaining what Druid's plan is. And you have a panel here and there basically confirming what he has said in action is, of course, taking place. It, it doesn't go all according to plan. Obviously, I'll get to that here in a moment. But they get into an argument over semantics, whether or not he's anti-deviant or anti-mutant. I don't know why Moira McTaggart and Orcus would actually want to work with the Eternals. Perhaps they're aware that the Eternals need Earth to be a turtle themselves. Because without Earth, they have nowhere to resurrect, essentially. They, they have to have a human die when they die so they can keep on living Maybe that's why they think that these guys are going to be good partners as far as eradicating the mutants themselves. And the war essentially kicks off as they're having a bagel, and there's an enormous psychic attack from the uni mind themselves, and they start bombarding Krakoa from above with psychic warfare, and they're, and they're entering the minds of Professor X and Jean Grey and really hurting the telepath. And then it's death from above as they send in some eternal soldiers to penetrate the airspace of Krakoa, and the war is on. Although at this point... 
The mutants know it's coming because Destiny has stated that it's actually going to be the Eternals that attack them. They're actually in the middle of a quiet council meeting, but it was kind of boring. I didn't want to show you that part. And one of the big parts of Druid's plan is he's sitting in the Jack of Knives as an assassin to Krakoa to take out the five. So you have the psychic warfare and you have the foot soldiers there to distract everybody so the Jack of Knives can get to. And we've been told when this moment happens, when even one of the five is taken out, all hope is lost. Resurrection as an idea, as a reality for mutants is lost. And Wolverine is not able to save him. He knows that Jack of Knives is there and he can smell Gold Ball's blood on his knife, but he can't even see him. Apparently he has some type of cloaking technology. And you see clearly that he has killed Gold Balls and Hope. So there is no more resurrection left for the mutants of Krakoa. This is it. We've finally seen the event that we've been waiting for for essentially three years. Once you take out one of the five, all hope is lost. Although Sink is there kind of as a backup, but he will end up aging and dying if he uses someone's mutant powers when he's not near them so even if they can keep this up it's only going to be very temporary and this feels like it should be in a big event right jonathan hickman and the x-men writers have been building to this event this day this moment in a comic book for essentially three years and guess what it's not important because it's marvel comics and it's jordan white and it's the x-men so they just happen to have eggs ready for all of them to rehatch anyway so there are no stakes. We finally see something that Marvel Comics X-Men have said would be devastating to the X-Men, to the mutants on Krakoa, the death of one of the five. We see the death of two of them, and it meant absolutely nothing because they were prepared, apparently. They've just got eggs ready to hatch with the five, and there are no stakes involved ever. They could have done this, I don't know, in issue three or something. Maybe there was a secret stash of eggs somewhere, and they had to go get them in a mission to bring them back so we could get Resurrection back. But there are no stakes. They just wrap it up like in two pages. Absolutely ludicrous that this would be one of the big payoffs and a big moment in this comic book. This is one of the reasons that this isn't like a highly recommend, because you get stupid stuff like this. And it turns out the mutants on Mars are also under attack, and we see... Nightcrawler has returned through the last gate that was left. All the others had been destroyed, and Hope is like, oh my goodness, where's my dad? I lost my father. This should feel like a big event. We just lost Cable. Is she going to be able to get her dad back? Absolutely. On the same damn page, you just have the five who have been freshly resurrected dancing around an egg, and there comes Cable back because there are no stakes in the goddamn thing. My goodness, how frustrating this is. This could have been a great comic book. This should have been action-packed and felt important, but they removed everything important about it within like a page or two of it happening. Now, I did mention Arako. Apparently, some bad things were happening there. There's essentially genocide on Arako. As far as I can tell, and what we are shown in the comic book, Thanos' grandpa, Uranus, went to Arako and exterminated every mutant. We see Magneto's helmet. We see all the mutants are apparently dead, but this is the only page you get of this. They wasted so many pages with characters talking, and you don't even see the mass genocide of all the Iraqi mutants and Storm and Magneto and all these other characters we're supposed to care about. This is why when Doc and I were talking about the Iraqo mutants moving to Marvel, we were like, this isn't going to be important. They're just cannon fodder, and they didn't even have the decency to show the characters die. That's why it's not important. If it was important, they would have shown the characters fighting back and then falling and made it impactful, made it like a moment where we had Wolverine and Nightcrawler on the Orca space station trying to get rid of the mother mold. Remember how emotionally impactful that moment was where they were essentially giving up their lives to save their friends and their nation? Of course, the stakes were removed from that the next issue, but at least Jonathan Hickman had the decency to wait an issue before removing any emotional impact from that. We don't even get that here. A million mutants just died on Mars, and this is what you get for it. This is the only indication that that even happened We've moved back to Avengers Mountain, the celestial body, and the Avengers are finding out that Krakoa was under attack. Now, they haven't lost everything, but they have lost Mars, and there's a message being sent out by Druig. He says, people of Earth, I am Druig of the Eternals. I am speaking to you via your extremely impressive high-tech devices. Kieran Gillen's dialogue in this comic book is really snarky and off-putting. I will give it that as well. I could use telepathy, but we consider that intrusive and crass. It's a nouveau mortal a move. And yes, I'm talking about these mutants. They're a threat to you all. They have overstepped their natural bounds and clearly aim for a dominion that stretches across worlds and eternity. We apologize that we've let them go so far, but rest assured, we will protect you. 
We will serve you as we have for millions of years. And people are crying. They're so happy that the mutants are finally being extinguished. Hell, I'm one of them. I'm still rooting for the Eternals, even though I think this comic book could have been executed at a much higher level. He does say, however, because he's raising these enormous world-ending devices off the west coast of the United States. It looks like there's about three or four of them, and they're heading for the coastal areas. And he says, hey, if you're on the coast, you need to move inland. And that's what we know about the plan of Druid and the Unimind. Apparently, Arako is no more. There's not a living mutant on Mars anymore. Krakoa has survived. They've rehatched the five already. So that was no big deal. And now we have what looked to be some type of high-tech kaiju off the coast of the West Coast. And then we get our last big reveal. A group of Eternals have infiltrated Avengers Mountain with Mr. Sinister, who they kidnapped and apparently have gagged. Ajak arrives. She says, this is a holy war born of holy scripture. A god can rewrite the scripture and end the war. We simply have to build a god. Help us build our god. Tony Stark says, this plane is pure hubris. But speaking broadly, I'm pro-hubris. But how on earth are we going to make a god in a few hours? And she says, look around you, Mr. Stark. Of the Avengers, we have everything we need. Speaking about the celestial body, which will be reborn and apparently be some type of device from God to take out the Eternals and fight them. There's some really good stuff in this comic book. There's some good ideas and plans laid, but the execution is really poor. Events that we were told were really important and would be very highly impactful when they happen, happen in this comic book and are just brushed over in a matter of pages so that we could get an unnecessarily large amount of exposition through characters because Kieran Gillen is ashamed that he's a comic book superhero writer. You know, I'm sorry, buddy. It's not bad, but it could have been so much better. We should have seen the death and destruction on Araka. We should have seen the death of all the mutants on Mars. That's essentially genocide of a million mutants happening at that moment, just completely breezed over. They should have tried to murder the five, but if you didn't want to kill them now, Wolverine and maybe a couple other people step in and, and they stop Jack of Knives, but maybe they die in the process and he leaves and they have to resurrect them. But they realize that they have an assassin that is gunned directly on the five. And that's really what the stakes are. They have to keep them protected and stuff like that. There were so many better ways to do this without kind of ruining a moment that we've pretty much been told was important since day one. I truly believe they could have stuffed a lot of the crap in this comic book that kind of bogs it down and expanded out the more interesting things and shown some of the consequences of the actions happening as we're reading the comic book in here. If they'd put it into Axe Eve of Judgment, which was a really bad comic book, it was really boring. Doc and I talked about this. It's just, there's not even one page of action in this entire comic book. Kieran Gillen, I love him or hate him. He's okay sometimes, and sometimes he's just the worst, like right here. 